Matthew 26, 36 through 46. When you have it, say amen. amen. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing. Oh, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, then I will be done. He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now. Take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. I want to uh, talk from this text. Remain standing, we want to pray, but I want to talk from this text. I, I believe that there were three extremely significant moments that propel Christ into his destiny. Three of them. And I believe that these moments reflect moments in your life in between you and your destiny. The wilderness, the garden, and the cross. The wilderness, the garden, and the cross. The wilderness is a place of personal temptation. The cross is a place where carnality is destroyed. But the garden is the place where God begins to take us through a tight place. If you've never been through a tight place, then you won't understand what would make you keep saying the same prayer. <laughs> over and over again, God, it's, it's me again. I, I, I don't have anything new to tell you. I just want to say the same thing I said yesterday. Would you fix this or fix me or fix something? <laughs> the next day, Lord, it's me again. <laughs> Nothing has changed. And I need to talk to you about this again. I have no updates. I have no new information. But I'm coming to you because I have nobody else You are the God of my tight places. Good God. I can, I can sit down now. Because I can tell, first of all, before I preach, let me tell you that, that, that you can't preach this text from a seminary. You have to have come back from a cemetery. You have to have been between a rock and a hard place. 
and, and had trouble on every side of you to know how effective your relationship with God becomes in tight places. And I sense that there are others in the room who understand what it's like to cry unto God from a tight place. It is to them that we minister this morning. Father, I thank you for your goodness and grace. I thank you for your presence in this building. I thank you for your faithfulness and your commitment to us. I humbly confess that you've been better to me than I've been to you. And I thank you for you've been faithful when I wasn't faithful. When I got tired, you didn't get tired. And when I gave up, you didn't give up. I thank you for being the God of tight places. Bless all around this room, those who got up this morning and came out purely to seek your face. Just, just shine on them. And those that may have just wandered in, don't really know why they came, invited in, pushed in, coerced in, let something supernatural happen while they're here today. In Jesus' name we pray. Somebody shout amen. amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Sometimes my greatest problem is not knowing for sure how things will turn out. Several years ago, Dr. Oral Roberts came to this church and began to minister. And during our time of fellowship, I said to him, Dr. Roberts, it must be wonderful to be you. And he said, why? I said, because you're an old man. He snickled and said, what's wonderful about being an old man? I, I replied, because you know how your story ends. And you've lived long enough to stand around and see the grand finale of your effectiveness, what you've done, how your children turned out, how your career has progressed, your books written, your message accomplished, and you're still standing on the stage taking an encore in the winter of your life. It must be wonderful to know how your story ends. Now, I know you say you know, but everybody thinks they know. People have babies and will them houses and property at six months old. <laughs> because they think they know how the story will end. They spend thousands of dollars in elaborate weddings because they think they know how the story will end. They pack up and move from one end of the country to the other end or from one part of the world to another part of the world to take a job. They pull up all of their stakes, leave everything they know to take a job because they think they know how the story ends. But it's a long ways from a six month old to a 36 year old. And a lot of things can happen to a little junior. It's a long ways from a wedding cake to a silver anniversary cake. And a lot of things can happen in between. It's a long ways from taking a job to getting a gold watch after 20 years and a lot of things can happen between then. And the truth of the matter is, part of our agony lies in the uncertainty of not being sure how things are going to end. Most people don't really get engaged in their life. They stand like voyeurs with their nose pressed up against the window pane, watching their life, not completely attached to it, trying to protect themselves from it because they're not really sure how the story is going to end. I believe that most people have a wedding years before they get married. That they've had the wedding and they stay together and they are legally attached, but it takes a long time for them to really be joined together. What the Bible says, for this cause shall a man leave his mother and father and take unto him a wife and they shall cleave. That cleaving process is not done in a 30 minute ceremony. It takes years for people to cleave to the point that they're really what I call all in. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, they're physically there, but just because somebody's physically there doesn't mean that they're mentally and emotionally there. People can be there and still not be all in. Some of you sitting here now still have your nose pressed against the window pane of your relationship just in case. Not really loving with your whole heart, you, you, you attach to a degree emotionally, but a, a certain part of your heart you have protected and encased in a shrine of protection to keep yourself from being hurt just in case. <laughs> and they don't even know that a part of you is just as single as it was before the wedding because... <laughs> I don't want to mess with you this morning. I know it's Sunday morning. I'm, I'm not going to bother you. you. You work the job. You come to the job. You punch the clock. You do the assignment, but they're really not getting the best out of you because you're not really sure now whether you are as excited about being there as you were when you started because you're not sure you have a certain insecurity about how things are going to end, and insecurity can give you terrible torment. Insecurity can keep you up at three o'clock in the morning. Insecurity can make you leave a way of escape out of a place that you enjoy being in. Insecurity can make you angry. Insecurity can make you overreact to situations. Insecurity can change your personality. Insecurity can distort your position on any issue, not because anything terrible has happened, but perchance it might happen. Insecurity can bring out strange things even in good people and it will play havoc with evil people. Insecurity is not something you want to minimize. And so I've been in some tight places, places that, that made you wonder, am I going to make it through this alive? And I, I just don't know whether I can make it through this. I made it through that. I made it through that. And I dealt with that over there, but this thing that I'm facing right now is so overwhelming and I'm tired. Mm -hmm. See, see, if, can you feel me? See, if, if, if I wasn't tired, if it would have caught me 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it wouldn't be a problem, but it caught me tired and, and disenfranchised and, and disoriented and, and somewhat cynical. Because see, when things catch you uh, early, you're optimistic. I, 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 what we call being optimistic is, is often naivety because you don't know what all could happen. You know, young people, they do crazy things because they don't know what could happen and, and, and they don't understand why as you get older, you get careful. It's not that, that age has made you timid. It's just that after you've seen what could happen, all of a sudden, I, I, used, to, I used to drive at 140 miles an hour screaming and laughing with no seatbelt on, but after I saw enough car wrecks happen, I buckled my seatbelt and backed down to 55. It, it's not that I don't like the excitement anymore, but I know what... <laughs> I used to not go to the doctor when I saw a knot or a dark spot break out in a strange place, but after I saw so many people develop cancer and die, now when I see something, I start checking it every day because, because, because it, it could be a bruise, but it could be something else, and I don't, I, I know now what could happen. And then you find yourself in a tight place. I wonder, have you ever got tired in a tight place? A tight place is a place when you're not there yet. You're closer than you were, but you're not there yet. And now it's a challenge to get to the next level. And you're not sure that you got the push that you used to have. And you're in a tight place. Add to that, have you ever secretly been in a tight place? <laughs> yeah, secretly, secret, still smiling. Good morning. Oh, yes, it's a hot one today, isn't it? 
This is gonna be a scorcher. I don't know how long this is going to last. Ooh, I tell you. And as soon as they walk away, you say, Just smiling at appropriate times, bowing when you're supposed to, shaking hands when you're supposed to, and, and surrounded by people <laughs> who do not realize they don't have a clue that you met me in a tight place, <laughs> that, that, that I'm smiling from a tight place, that I'm, that I'm working from a tight place, that I'm, I'm doing a PowerPoint presentation, but I, my mind is not even on the presentation. I've just done this so long that I know how to do what I do when I need to do like I do, but I'm really thinking about what's going on back over here because I'm, I'm in a tight place and, and, and don't mess with me right now. Because if you do, I may really just clock on you and you won't even know why I reacted like that because you never had a clue that I was doing the presentation, but I was really. <laughs> in a tight place. It's very human. It has nothing to do with being poor or rich or black or white, or male, or female. It's just a human thing to have uncertainty and anxiety and to live your life from a tight place. And I can understand it quite clearly when it comes to me and you, but, but, but today in my text, this is not an ordinary person. This is Jesus. And there are several distinctives he is the only begotten Son of God. He is the eternal Son of God. He is in the boardroom of the Godhead and the council of God's own divinity. He was there when the worlds were framed. Before there was a where or a when or a this or that, he was the word that dispatched from the Father's mouth when he said, let there be, Christ was the preceding, prevailing word that came out of the mouth of the Father. Do you not remember? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He knows the beginning. And according to John the Revelator, he knows the end. He's not just Alpha, he's Omega. The first and the last, the beginning and the end. According to the scriptures, he is omniscient, omniscience, all-knowing, science to know, omni, all. He knows all things. The one thing we are clear, Jesus knows how the story is going to end. He is not doubtful as to whether he's going to come out of this. He knows that when everything is said, he says things like, if you destroy the temple, in three days I'll raise it back up again. He knows who he is. Even as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days, so shall the Son of Man be in the lower parts of the earth. He knows he will rise again. He knows it. He knows it. He has the assurance that it, he will get out of this. Yet, face to face with the process that precedes the promise. Sometimes you can have the promise, have faith in the promise, believe it's going to happen, but when you run head on into the process, the process is so staggering and so painful that you say, Lord, I wonder, and I know I will, but I wonder, I know what you said, but I wonder, I, I've already seen the end, but I wonder, I've already got a vision, but I wonder, I already saw myself coming out of debt, but I wonder, I already saw myself overcoming, but I what is there anybody in here who's ever been uncertain I, I, I used to think and I still believe it's true that the Garden of Gethsemane was about the alignment of human will with divine will that, that all we are seeing is is a needle coming to a 12 o'clock position that that the will 
of the Son is just lining up through prayer with the will of the Father. Like 12 noon when two needles meet at one point. I used to think, I used to think that the whole process, the ticking, tick, 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 it's just the minute hand lining up with the hour hand until they become one at 12 noon, pointed in the same direction. Yeah. I used to think that the, that the whole process we got to watch is watch how difficult it is to bring your will into alignment with God's. And it really is. It really is. It, it, it really is difficult to bring your will into alignment with God because sometimes God wants things for me. <laughs> I, I hate to say this because maybe you won't want me to be your pastor, but, but sometimes God wants things for me that I don't want for myself. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes God makes choices for me without asking <laughs> my opinion and it seems like I would like for it to be a time in my life where sometimes he would be the minute hand and I would be the hour hand and he would just bring his power and his resources and his money and his potential in alignment with what I want. Let him do some moving up in this mug because, because I already know how I want this to turn out. Why do I always have to be the one to move? Why do I always have to be the one that gives up on my plans and my dreams and my goals and my expectations? And who said I wanted to be a preacher anyway? And who said I want to move to Chicago? And who told you I want to be in this marriage? And who said I want to drive this same car? Who? And so, on one level, it's quite clear to me that we are watching wheels coming into alignment to form that 12 noon vertical position where everything, both me and God, are both looking toward the same direction at the same time. That is enough to drive you into fervent prayer. That alone. But it occurs to me that there's something deeper going on here than that. That in reality, what is really going in on is I am getting an opportunity to see what it is like to walk with God who has shown me the end from the beginning but didn't show me the middle and and sometimes face to face not with the end not with the beginning but face with the middle it becomes stressful now Isaiah has said I'm not boring you am I uh, Isaiah said, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it's wonderful. It's wonderful to wait, but, but waiting can be great pressure. And it seems unfair that I have to wait when I am a finite individual dealing with an infinite God. When I am a temporal man dealing with an eternal God and you ask me to wait, you ask me for something I have the least of. You ask me for time. You got eternity. You don't have nothing to do for eternity. I'm getting old while I'm waiting. Now, I know, I know y'all don't ever talk like this, but this, this is my Sunday to confess. Sometimes I tell, look, look, you got all of eternity to wait for this. You can just take a bath and eat a donut and drink some coffee. You don't have to worry about this. But while you're waiting to heal me, waiting to bless me, waiting to bring me out of debt, waiting to send me a wife, waiting to send me a husband, have you noticed that I'm getting old up in this mud? My knee's going out, my back is hurting, my hair is getting gray, I got crow feet on my lips, and I am getting old. You know you're old when you, when you get crow feet on your lips. 
You know when you when people walk up to you and say you're smiling and you're not. <laughs> Everything just. Jesus does not go into the garden to find out how the story ends. He's trying to deal with the middle. And most of us in here are struggling to deal with the middle. We know that somehow or other in the end we're going to win. But, but in the meantime, <laughs> while we're waiting on this happy ending, what about this hateful middle? Oh, I got a happy ending coming, but this hateful middle is a mess. This hateful middle, I mean, that's what you write stories about and novels about and books about is hateful middle, not happy ending. People say, I like stories with a happy ending, but what makes a happy ending a happy ending is a hateful middle. And some of you right now, God has promised you a happy ending, but you got a hellacious middle, and you're saying, how long will I deal with this? I don't know how long I'll deal with this. <laughs> he comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. A garden is supposed to be a beautiful place. Isn't it funny how you can have an ugly problem in a beautiful place? Finally got the house, isn't it lovely? New drapes, floral arrangement. That picture you put on layaway, you finally got it out and put it over the fireplace. Isn't it beautiful? And before you could really enjoy how nice it is, now you got an ugly problem going on so bad that you don't even look at the picture anymore. Because you may be in a garden, but you got an ugly problem. The garden is called the Garden of Gethsemane. It literally means the place of pressing. The place of pressing. The place where olives crush and oil is secreted. The place in the middle. The place where pressure mounts is different from the wilderness because in the wilderness we have an enemy that we can argue with. In the cross we have a physical problem we can see. In the garden there's nothing to be seen, just pressure. There used to be a bridge in West Virginia, Point Pleasant, I believe, called the Silver Bridge. It collapsed one day. It collapsed. No bombs, no explosives. It collapsed one day. Cars had been going across this bridge for years, just coming and going, just going, coming and going. Bridge just doing what it was supposed to do. And one day, while cars were going across, boom, it collapsed from pressure. Too many things had gone across it too many times without inner support. The great strong bridge collapsed without dynamite or explosives or enemies or assassins. Just too many things had gone across it too many times. And old faithful became old falling because of pressure. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane trying not to crack. The 5,000 that he fed down by the sea that, 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 that Pastor Owens was preaching about Sunday night, they're gone. Out of bread. Out of fish. When people get where they can get nothing else from you, Soon as you run out of them 12 baskets full you got left, they be gone. Soon as you stop handing out free lunch, they'll be gone. 5,000, nowhere to be found. 
The 70 elders, after they cast out devils and, and got their positions and got their titles, they were gone. The 12 disciples, he says, wait right here. And the Bible said he went on a little further because as pressure gets tighter, you begin to separate more and more from those around you because pressure separates you from fellowship and fraternity because little by little you begin to realize, ain't nobody going through this but me. Have you, have you, it's, it's, like, it's like, here's my illustration for this. My wife was having a baby. She was having a baby and she was in the labor and I was checking on her and going back, go get some meat, come back, check on her again. Okay. Going back, make a few phone calls, come back, check on her again. And whenever I came to check on her, I'd get her by the hand and say, I'm with you. I'm with you. And they say, uh, Elder Jakes, what are you doing uh, in town? I said, we're having a baby. Have you ever heard men say, we're having a baby? They're lying. <laughs> we ain't having a baby. We are not having a baby. She is having a baby. I was looking at the machine to see when the contractions came. I was telling her, here comes another one. That was okay for the first three hours. By that fourth hour, she told me, shut up, I know. I had to look at a machine to see something that she was having because she could feel the pressure of the contraction on the inside. And when you are up under pressure, can't nobody feel it like, oh God. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Holding my hand and saying cute stuff does not make you connected to the level of suffering that I am going through. Sending me a card doesn't mean that you are with me when the pressure is on. Is there anybody in here who's going through hell and people don't seem to understand? So Jesus drops the 12 and he went on a little further. He went on because he didn't have any choice. This was his baby. <laughs> his pressure, his contraction, his stress. Now he's down to his, his inner circle. His inner circle. These are your boys. These are your boys. Your inner circle, your confidants. And he says, I want you to be agreeing with me in prayer. <laughs> you, know, you know, church people, we say, the, we say the nicest things when you're really going through. I'm agreeing with you in prayer. Don't worry, brother, I'm interceding for you. And, and they walk away and say, bless them, Lord. Because they don't want to forget to pray for you. Now, the reason that they run the risk of forgetting to pray for you is that they don't feel the pressure. <laughs> See, I can't forget to pray for me because I feel the pressure of trying to push this sucker out. But you are so comfortable, if you don't hurry up and pray, you could forget I got a cancerous tumor. You could forget that they're coming to get my car tomorrow at 4 o'clock. You could forget that this is my second eviction notice and I still have no job. You could forget. I can't forget. So Jesus went on a little further, and that's what pressure does for you. It makes you go on a little further. And he says to the three, he says, pray with me. He goes into the garden to pray. He comes out. Just, just the way we vacillate when we're up under pressure, looking for somebody who connects. He just comes back. Just, just not that he thinks that they have more clout with the Father than him, but for the fellowship of suffering just would you suffer with me oh that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering you know anybody wants to know you in the power of your resurrection 
But have you ever suffered to the point that you just wanted somebody fellowship with me in this? Just don't give me no quick answers, no simple solution. If you come in and I'm groaning and crying, you groan and cry. When I grunt, you grunt. If my leg's in the stirrups, you put your legs in the stirrups because it would give me some comfort just to know that somebody else can you feel me. And he walks up on him. And they're asleep. And his frustration is obvious. <laughs> Have you ever walked up to your closest people and said, You, you, you want to just, <laughs> you love them, you love them, but you still, <clears throat> because you don't seem to connect with what I'm going through. Can you watch with me one hour? He goes back in and pray, because when you're up under pressure, you want to connect on a human level. Just, just be with me. Come sit in the hospital, in the waiting room with me. Just wait with me. Go, go to the courthouse with me. I know you're not a lawyer. I know you didn't even finish high school. Just, 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 <laughs> you, know, you don't know anything about law, litigation. You don't know anything about anything. Just ride down there with me. Be with me. Your presence. Your presence. <laughs> Everything, every support base around you disappoints you. Everybody you call, their line is busy. Everybody you reach out to, they're distracted by something else. And, and the pressure is mounting. And you are alone. And like a carpenter with a piece of wood in a vise, every moment it gets tighter. Because you're in a tight place. Whoever I'm preaching to today, you are in a tight place. Normally you don't break, normally you don't crack, normally you can be sociable, normally you're connected, normally you are a giver, but right now, you're in a tight place. And when people are in a tight place, I always say desperate people do desperate things. When you're tight, just, you know, can I connect? Hey, hey, you with me? You with me? You with me? Okay, all right. I'll come back and check later. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What makes you keep going back to something that ain't working? <laughs> Have nowhere else to go. I know you sleep. You're probably going to be asleep when I get back. But I'm going to check you later, <laughs> just in case. Because when we're up under pressure, we have a tendency to reach for stuff that really don't work. <laughs> Wonder what you're reaching for that really don't work. Have you identified your sleepy soldiers? Because as the pressure mounts, one of the things that God has to get out of you is that proclivity that we all have to need one another to be something that we will not be. And God can't really get the glory out of your life until your expectations are removed from things that don't work. Now, I can't tell you how long that's going to take because Jesus went back three times <laughs> checking on folks who were somewhere else <laughs> while he was under pressure. He goes back and he says, he goes from talking to them to talking to the Father. Father, if it be thy will, pass this bitter cup from me. He ain't hearing nothing over there. <laughs> Would you watch with me one hour? 
He ain't get nothing over there. Not my will, but thine be done. Goes back out there. Are you asleep again? <laughs> but the third time, sometimes you have to pray through a process and a period to find the God of your tight places. This is not going to be no microwave, quick, fast, slam dunk, Johnny come lately, easy attain, breakthrough in your life. You have to go through a process to finally get to the place in your life where you have made that level of contact. The Bible says Paul did it too. Three times he prayed, for, uh, uh, oh, uh, take this thorn out of my flesh. Get this thing out of me. This is driving me crazy. Three times the apostle Paul had to pray about the same thing before he made contact with God and God said my grace is I'm not gonna move it your marriage will not be better your child will still act crazy but my grace oh y'all don't hear me you're never gonna be appreciated you're never gonna be recognized but you will learn my grace is sufficient for you I've got you covered You don't need what you thought you need. You don't need who you thought you needed. All you need is me, my grace, and the bullshit. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. My grace is sufficient. But Lord, I'm on a walker. My grace is sufficient for thee. Lord, I'm in a wheelchair. I understand that. But my grace is sufficient for thee. I'm not going to heal every blind person. I know you don't want to hear that, but every blind person doesn't get healed. Every lame person doesn't start walking. But my grace. Sometimes the happy ending is not that everything works out the way you want it to. Sometimes the happy ending is walking with God till you come to a place that it doesn't bother you anymore. <laughs> we gotta stop preaching this magic Christian religion where everybody becomes a millionaire and everybody's riding a Porsche and everybody gets a degree and nobody ever gets sick and all of your children turn out wonderful and everybody's marriage works. The devil is a lie. Some of that stuff is not going to work out, but God said, my grace. Oh, shut up. I got to get out of here because I feel something down in my soul. My grace. I want to tell you this Sunday morning that there is a grace for every garden you're in. There is a grace for every Gethsemane you face. There is a grace for every pressure you endure. There is a grace for every tragedy that presses down on your human soul and you feel like your bridge is about to crack. But God said, my grace! You say, you're saying to God, I'm just like that silver bridge, Lord. If one more car goes across this old bridge, I'm going to crack. I just cannot deal with another thing. But God is saying, no man built you. I built you to my divine 
specifications and I took into consideration every car that could come across your bridge and I built you in such a way you might not be pretty you may be rusty you may need a paint job you may not be the finest technology but I got strength in places in you that you haven't even seen yet my grave all of your sisters and brothers had beautiful children you picked up a bassinet, painted a room, got wallpaper, and birthed a child with Down syndrome. Your child was born deformed. Can't send it back, this in the Spiegel catalog. Brought him up for prayer. Condition persists. What do we do when things don't turn out the way we expected? We find ourselves in a tight place. And all God says is, my grace is sufficient for you you got married got married thought everything was going to be wonderful never thought that your husband would be an invalid that your wife would end up in a wheelchair and there you are rolling somebody you expected to be hugging and god says my grace is sufficient for thee a widow at 25 and god says my grace is sufficient for thee 25 years you've been by yourself god says my grace is sufficient for thee didn't think you could raise that child by yourself did you but god said my grace is sufficient for thee everybody else got a husband to help them but god said my grace is sufficient for thee everybody else got somebody they can go to but god said my grace is all you need for what you face uh, who am I preaching to? I, I just want to know who is it? Throw your hands up and thank the God of your tight places right now. If you're in a tight place, you, ought to, you gotta learn how to pray them from a tight place. Shadabosa. Oh God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God, oh God, oh God, it's me again, it's me again, I'm in your face again, I'm looking to you again, I'm calling your name again, here I am Lord, the pressure is mounting, the storms are rising, the enemy's brewing, but Lord I thank you because you're the God of my tight places, you're the God of my not enough. You're the God of my wilderness experience. You're the God of my disappointment. You're the God of my circumstance. I thank you for being the God of my tight places, the God of my suffering child, the God of my failing marriage, the God of my unemployment, the God of my failing kidneys, the God of my diabetes, the God of my dilemma. Oh, Oh my God. Be seated. I, I want to tell you, you know, I'm always getting these people come up who want my anointing. <laughs> Lord told me he was going to give me T.D. Jason's anointing. I was preaching places and he throw my handkerchief out. I couldn't get it back. They take your handkerchief. It's an anointed handkerchief. They take the handkerchief home. Oh, I got his anointing and then his sweat. Pretty much seemed like sweat to me, but they say his anointing and then the sweat. Then there's some people come up, lay hands on me, brother. Just lay hands on me so I can get your anointing. I think, please. What kind of justice would it be for you to get in a flash what I suffered a lifetime to get? What? of justice would it to be for you to take my handkerchief without sickness without pain without agony without rejection without betrayal without groaning without loneliness without death 
and destruction and get in a flash what I had to crawl through hell and fire to come out with the devil in the line. I said the next time somebody asked me to pray that they'd have my anointing. I started to pray that their childhood would be wrecked, that their past would be crushed and broken, that they'd be raised in a hellacious environment with all kind of confusion and suffering beyond human comprehension that they bury their father in their teens and their mother be sick half of their life. I'm talking to really pray. Can you imagine? Let me, let me agree with you in prayer that you would lose your car and lose your house and suffer in a house with no lights and no water and work your fingers down to the bone and be rejected and be ostracized, alienated, criticized, thrown out of churches, put out of building, ostracized, said he has no ministry, can't preach, can't do anything. Oh no, come on, come on, I want you to get this anointing. I want you, come on, come on, I want you to have this anointing. The truth of the matter is until you've had the vice trust you somewhere you can't have you must be out of your mind you must be out of your mind Gethsemane the place of pressing was the place where the olives were crushed bring me some some consecrated oil it's a place where the olives were crushed. The place of Gethsemane, the place of refinement. This, this decanter is filled with oil that's been prayed over. And we call it consecrated oil. And uh, we buy it in the store. You can get it at the store, just olive oil, for maybe about three or four dollars. And then you can put it in the bottle of your choice and pray over it. It's consecrated oil. And when somebody asks you how much it costs, you can say it costs you four dollars because you're not the olive. Somewhere, somewhere behind some oil refinery in the trash can, in a dumpster, is some bruised, beaten, discarded, half pulverized olive who could tell you how much it costs for every drop of this oil. Something had to die and be up under pressure and deal with agony and be ostracized. You can't get this with no four dollars. Something has to be pressed above measure and beyond strength and at the breaking point and every time something hit it, another drop came out of that olive. And there are some people in this room, the reason we got anointed is because all hell broke loose in our lives and the more the enemy afflicted us, the the more we grew, and this is the God of my tight places. This is how he gets the glory out of your life, by crushing your flesh, crushing the parts of you that you like the best and the parts you needed the most. This is how he gets it out of you, drop by drop by drop, by drop. You don't know the cost of the oil in my alabaster box. You don't have a clue what it costs to do what I do. You don't have a clue what it costs for the person standing next to you. And before you get envious and jealous and say, I would like to be her and I would like to be him, you ought to ask them how much it costs to keep smiling when all hell is breaking loose in your life.
the thing the thing that fascinates me most about this text and I preached out of this text a long time a lot of things different stages and ages he went on a little further I preached about Gethsemane the place of peril I preached the threefold prayer I preached calling him father while the son is bleeding I preached about the sweat of blood that came out of the pores in his skin pressed to the point that blood began to come out of the pores of his skin what do you do when you're bleeding in strange places I preached a lot of things out of this text because I know what it is to have blood coming out of places I never expected it to come from not literally but spiritually and emotionally and financially and every other kind of way thank God not literally but the thing that awes me this morning is to finally come to that place of going back and forth to sleepy people looking for something that they can't give you to finally get to the place where he comes to them the third time and he says two words that made me preach this sermon sleep on sleep on I know you're tired get some rest it's all right now no more pulling against you for something that I now know you don't have If you keep talking to the God of your tight places, you will speak to the place of your frustration and say, sleep on. <laughs> Ain't it good? <laughs> if, if you keep talking to the God of your tight places, you will finally come to speak to the place of your frustration. And in two words, resolve it all sleep on today this Sunday morning in every person in this room who's in a place of pressing every person in this room who's up under pressure anywhere there's something that you've been looking to for consolation that you need to look at and say sleep on You'll never be free. You'll never be whole. Still holding out for that ex-husband to come back. Been 10 years. You'll never be free to get what God has in your future until you can put away his pictures, put them away, and say, Stand to your feet, I'm, I'm finished with you. But I feel something in this room. I feel God on the other side of your sleep on saying, now I'm gonna take you through what you thought you couldn't go through. And now I'm gonna bring you out of what you thought you couldn't come out of. Now that you're finally through looking to them to be to you what I wanted to be to you, now I'm gonna get the glory. <laughs> And, and if you talk about a happy ending early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hand said that where is your sting? Grave! Where is your victory? And then he said, I'm not just somebody walking around here. I am he that was dead, but I'm alive. Tell 
somebody say, I made it, I made it. Watch this. Sis, it was only when I prepared this message that I realized what could have been Jesus' reason in the tomb when he rose from the dead, finding nothing to wear. He spoke himself a gardener's outfit and came stepping out of the tomb dressed as a gardener. I suddenly realized that the cross was settled in the garden of Gethsemane. And when he stepped out in the gardener's suit, he looked like somebody just working a garden so much so that Mary didn't even know who he was until he turned around and said, Mary, and she heard his voice. She said, Rabboni. Suddenly I recognized that he had gone through his garden, but he rose up as a gardener to help me through mine.